Welcome to Underline. I'm Christian Williams, coming up for discussion on our Viewpoints panel. Well, according to a top developmental child expert, some parents are, quote, god-awful. Later on, confessions of a good Christian girl. Stay tuned. And these are the issues we'll be presenting today to our Viewpoints guests for commentary. One of Canada's foremost childhood development experts declares only a third of parents are doing a great job. The rest range between okay and god-awful. A convenient new tool to end relationships, email. You don't even have to face them. And the hollow halls of higher learning institutions, disinterest among the young seems to be on its way to being the new norm. Later on, the confessions of a good Christian girl. But first, let's meet our Viewpoints guests. Dr. Anthony Hutchinson is with the Brampton Neighborhood Resource Center. And the very Reverend Preeta Rawl is back with us, who is an Anglican minister. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. First issue we're talking about, I mean, parenting has been so much in the limelight lately. We, we see issues regarding children, how they're growing up, and today we're talking right from early childhood education right up to the university system. Now, according to this early childhood development expert, a man very respected in the field, if not Canada's foremost, his name is Fraser Mustard. He didn't mince words according to this report. In fact, quote it says here, he has given up on Canada getting early childhood education right during his lifetime. He talks about the fundamental importance of early childhood education. He also relates this to, unfortunately, the jobs that parents are doing when it comes to raising kids. Only 30%, he says, is doing a good job. The rest are going from okay to, in his view, god-awful, which unfortunately we're seeing later on in life, certain problems that come up as a result of a bad start. Mm -hmm. Love to hear what your feedback is on this article. I'm going to start with you, very <laughs> Reverend Peter Wall. Um, I think he's right. I think he's also right when he says that uh, solutions are hard to find. Yes. Uh, I think parenting has changed a lot over the last generation or two. Some of that economic, some of it um, uh, what we both demand of and expect from our children. Um, all the sort of arguments about uh, uh, how children learn and where they should best learn and the changes in families. I mean, I think it's pretty complex. I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a tough one to try and address and it needs a, a sort of a holistic, comprehensive approach. And ultimately, I think that the government is not putting enough resources in the right places, but that's only part of it. I think it's more, mm -hmm. there's more to it than that. Dr. Hutchinson, where do you stand here? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, Fr uh, Fraser Mustard uh, was uh, was a mentor in in terms of my the, my PhD thesis was was based on so much of his work on on the social determinants of health, of which early childhood development is a key social determinant of health. And um, you know, as I as I I run an Ontario Early Years Centre, which is funded by the uh, Ministry of Children and Youth mm -hmm. Service with the Brampton Neighbourhood Resource Centre. Fraser Mustard was instrumental in getting um, the Ontario Early, Early Years Centres up and running in Ontario. Um, but the fact of the matter is that many parents do struggle um, to be, yes. quote, good parents. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and definitely, I, I would say the majority are, quote, god-awful, but we have to ask, why is that the case? Why is that? Why um, do you think it is? Uh, well, I, you know, when, when you have um, single parents who are working double days to provide, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. pay for just rent and food, um, how can they really be an effective parent when, you know, they're just trying to survive? Um, you know, when you, we, have, we have innumerable latchkey kids. One mm -hmm. in three children um, live in poverty um, in, in uh, Toronto right now, um, and uh, most of those children are children of working parents. We call them the working poor. Um, the gap between rich and uh, um, and poor is, is, is has been increasing year over year for the last 20 years. While the poverty rate has, you no, know, the argument is the poverty rate has stayed around 18 percent, but the population in real numbers continues to grow. So that 18 percent is a is a higher number per capita year over mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So so I think that um, uh, our phrase, we're letting our children down um, as a society. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that the the, the, the problem is very complex, um, but Fraser's right. I mean, it, the, our, our, most, our early childhood development years are the most formative years. They're essential. We need to have more money in, in um, uh, early childhood centers in, in the province. The, government, the federal government needs to uh, make it a priority to eliminate child poverty. Do you think children are you know? undervalued in our society, as a culture I'm talking about here? And, and I'm not talking to this about this from the point of view of finger pointing. I'm just talking the culture. Do you think children are undervalued? 
Mm. I mean, everybody loves their kids. That's not what I'm getting at. I but do you think their needs... I think what's in, what, what is undervalued is how important it is for us to do the right thing with kids. Yes. And to think yes. that uh, if we just do it the way we've always done it, Mm -hmm. uh, then everything will be fine. But we have hundreds of kids going to school every day hungry because they don't get breakfast at home. Mm -hmm. Why don't mm -hmm. they get breakfast at home? Well, one of the reasons they don't get breakfast at home is because maybe there isn't a parent there to feed them because the parent is off, as Anthony says, doing two or two and a half jobs. Maybe the parent doesn't know very much about nutrition. Maybe there isn't any money to buy what people need You see, for that breakfast. category of people, I... I'm so sympathetic toward. Mm -hmm. But then there's the other, that the kid comes and says, well, I don't have an appetite this morning, I don't want to eat breakfast, so you just let them go to school without any breakfast at all, and well, the kid says, I don't feel like eating lunch either, so fine, the kid gets a chocolate bar and some chips and calls that a lunch. I, this is sure, also a part you see happening that concerns me in society. But the same thing happened to me. I didn't eat breakfast every day when I was a little kid, but it was there if I needed it, and I learned, I somehow figured it out. My kids went through much the same thing. Uh, but I think we have a systemic problem with, um, yes, with yes. Um, people who are living in extreme poverty, people who can't access or don't know how to access what they need to raise their kids properly. Um, too many latchkey kids, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. too many kids uh, who have no supervision, no good parental role models or no other good role models because kids are now coming from smaller families. We don't know our cousins and our uncles and our aunts mm -hmm. the way we Sad. used to. Sad. Um, there's a lot of factors I a think that work here. A lot of factors. Yeah, and I, I think there are uh, political actors and in the region of Peel they have the Families First initiative, they have mm -hmm. Success by Six um, uh, that are championed by people like Charlie Coffey and, and Fraser Mustard and, and I think that we are making strides however we cannot um, rely on government to fix our but problems you see, I either. see, I see no. ourselves moving uh, as a society more and more toward that very thing where you said government can't fix their problems. For instance, imagine the Ontario Liberals have to begin a program. It costs them two million dollars to introduce character education in the classrooms. Now you know what? I'm all for it. I love the idea. I see that it's a need in society today. And we could sit there crying over spilt milk and saying, well, we shouldn't be here. No, we shouldn't be at this point. Right. No, I understand we don't live in a utopia. But that is a question I'd like to hear what the two of you think when it comes to the point at which governments start to intervene. Because obviously if there's a breakdown in society, the government's going to intervene. We don't like government involvement. We start getting a little spooked. Well, is this becoming more and more um, sort of a, a, di a dictatorial state? Least government involvement, people tend to be happy. But there is a need out there. There's a void that the government more and more is being forced to fill. What are your views on this? Sure, sure. Less government means more people are happy. But less government also means that we have more problems. Look at that daycare center, the unlicensed daycare center in, I think it was Scarborough, wasn't oh, it? Oh, that was a travesty. Um, now, if we're going to insist, and I, as I think we should, on licensing daycare centers so that there is some sort of norm about mm -hmm. um, training and um, education and uh, materials and program, if we're going to do that, and I think most of us think we should, then let's make sure we have enough licensed daycares for the kids that need them and yes. that people aren't forced mm -hmm. into unlicensed daycare centers. Some people are forced into unlicensed daycare centers because there, there aren't enough centers. Others because they can't afford the licensed daycare centers. So let's figure out a way to do it. And I think I'm, I am not a person who supports, um, uh, to a fault, less government. I think there are some things that the government has to do. Yes. Um, and we all know what too much government gives us. But mm -hmm. I think we've... We, the pendulum has swung it has. way it has. too far the other way yes, and there is now a, it. a, uh, it's seen as a great virtue to have no government involvement and I don't think that's always mm -hmm. true. And mm -hmm. in this case, I think it's particularly untrue. Yes. And, I, and I think parents do need to take responsibility. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm very busy. I, I work a lot of hours, but you know, I always try and make that time for my kids. Um, uh, sometimes it's once or a couple times a week, but just to mm -hmm. spend that quality time. And I think that we need, to, you know, look, if we're going to have children, we have to make sacrifices for I them. Agree. Sure. And, I agree. And, and to, 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 and, and to let, let our children um, suffer in their earliest years of development um, is, is, is inexcusable. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I understand um, Dr. Mustard's uh, uh, frustration mm -hmm. and, and, and um, as much as we, you know, we can't expect governments to solve the problem, but we have to work together. I particularly you know? liked his balance because according to this article here, and if you think the child development expert advocates a national system of daycare centers, he'll soon set you straight. His focus here is we do need a system where we offer early childhood education, but he, he does not fail to emphasize this point, quote, since parents have the dominant effect on a child, you want to make certain you give parents every opportunity to be good. I like that balanced approach. I think we need 
parenting education as much as we need early childhood education. Yes. I think we need to create the kind of uh, atmosphere and economic mm -hmm. circumstances where um, uh, children can have a parent at home with them, where yes, parents yes. aren't forced back to work immediately. And I mean, it's not just one year of maternity leave. It is that first four or five years that becomes so critical. So how do we create a system where without penalizing someone's employment and that's um, the key, yes. very much, we mm -hmm. can have a parent at home because there's nothing like having a parent at home. I agree, 100%. Before school and after definitely. School. And, at definitely. Bram and at Brampton Neighborhood Resource Center, that we offer those. We offer um, early childhood development programs. It's not daycare, but what it right. is, is yes. it's working with the children and their parents we and need engaging this. them. And we need more and of this. And it's free of charge. We certainly do. We serve about 25,000 yeah. people a year. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. Good to know. <laughs> We're going to be going for a break now when we come back. While well, a new method of breaking up with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, email. You don't even have to face them. Stay tuned. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. The second issue we're talking about, breaking up electronically. That's the headline. Emails, text messages are new tools to end relationships. In this article, I thought it quite amusing, although it's not funny, but it was amusing. It had a twist. 44-year-old high-tech worker here. Take Emily. That, that's, that's who they're referring to here. She lives in the States, of course, and she, the way she describes this, this is what she says. You don't have to face them, explains Emily, who asked that her last name not be used. It's a <laughs> pattern of evasion here. It's definitely, quote, the easy way out, but she does admit, thank goodness, it's not the grown-up thing to do. But apparently this is something that we see going on more and more. People aren't even facing each other, and this is not the first case, the first time I've heard about this. I, no. In fact, I was quite appalled when the first time I heard the story of somebody broke up with someone over the internet because it just, it goes to show you. I, I mean, what have we become? What about integrity? Just old-fashioned integrity. If I sound old-fashioned, I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm happy to be that way because I see this as being a loud case of lack of integrity here. Okay. I'm going to start with you now after I'm off my soapbox. What about you? Well, I, I totally agree with you as a person who's been the victim of being dumped on several occasions by email Aww, and, and an text awe. messaging. I, I, I can, I can truly empathize with, with, with all, of, all of these people. Bigger question, have you done it? <laughs> I, no, I've never done. That. Good. <laughs> no, I would never do such a thing. I, I believe in doing. Know. I believe in confronting the person that yes. I, I, I'm, I'm with and who's you know a woman and have the decency. I, I, and, what about and, etiquette and, here? And I, I right. always admit I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Because I am. Good, good. And, 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 and sometimes, and, uh, sometimes. And, and, and I, I beg for forgiveness and I say, let's, wow. let's just do what this. a puppy dog. Yeah. And he knows he's always wrong. I mean, I, 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 you know. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that one. Exactly. I've been well trained. Does that look good? Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> what about you, Peter? Well, I'm an old curmudgeon, right? There are other words I could use, but curmudgeon is the one we'll stick with. I mean, I think that this is all part of a symptom. Uh, mm -hmm. How many of us write notes anymore? hand write mm. a note. Mm. Sit That's down true. and write a thank you note, write a happy birthday note, write a thinking of you note. We mm. do it electronically. Now, the fact that we do it is a good thing, but we have re we've moved over that line into, first of all, it's immediate, and if you send something, then you expect an answer, and we're going to do everything electronically. I suppose, and, and I must admit that as an old curmudgeon, I look at today's 20-somethings and the amount of both skill at and um, commitment to whatever they've got in their hands, um, they are amazing. I mean, they can, t they can text all over the place, they can communicate with everybody, they communicate all the time, you know, several you times said an something, hour. You said something I found very encouraging during one of our breaks, that you work with kids and you get them cooking and so on. This is, some, this is a lost art, getting together, playing board games, cooking. Right. They're seen as something gone. That's what right. really surprises me is that consultants and um, play experts are now being hired to teach kids how to, how to skip in the school system right. again, how to um, play, you know, the hopscotch thing. These should be natural. Right. We've mean, lost that communication skill. If I ran the, a, a public transit system, mm -hmm. I would ban iPods. Because well, they're not complaining about them being banned in school in Toronto. Because everyone is isolated. Right? You put yes. on your iPod, you play with your, your Blackberry or whatever uh, thing you have, <laughs> and <laughs> you don't have to interact with anyone. You don't have to listen to the person next to you. People now talk yes. to themselves all the time, and what they're doing is talking on a phone, which mm -hmm. is coming out of their ear. Um, 
I think it's it's a it's a terrible yes. uh, extent to which we've gone. I love email. Yes. I use it all the time. Me Wouldn't too. want to be without Businesses it. Businesses need it. You need but, it. But um, we still have to talk to each other, and we still mm -hmm. have to interact with other people. And we're losing this. And we're losing at it at a fundamental level. Yeah, and we're losing it in 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 spades. I think. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're, we're well replacing said. we're replacing education with computer screens, and we're we're d we're doing things through the, these virtual training, and and I think there's a there's a disconnect in terms of mm -hmm. us just as people. I mean, uh, we've become a simulation age society, you know, where and and it it, it almost you you wonder if you're are you in love with the, with the uh, the chatting <laughs> or the person? You know, and, and I, I see my daughter sometimes, and I say, "What are you doing?" And, and and she'll be on the internet. She goes, "I'm having an argument," and I'm like, "How are you having an argument?" And she's typing in capital letters and using all kinds of symbols. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. to myself, "Codes, codes, <laughs> the invasion of the iPod and." Yeah. You go and to a meeting, text messages. You go to a meeting amazing. with 20 yes. people in a room, and we're supposed to be talking to each other, and 15 of them will have, and I'm guilty of this too, <laughs> will have a will have a laptop in front of them. Or the crackberry. <laughs> um, so that they can make notes about other things and send emails to other people while they're participating in a meeting. It can't be all that important to do all that multitasking at the same time. And maybe what you and I need to do when we're sitting across a table from each other is actually talk to each other. Which is what we're doing here and today. Not and not do it all electronically, you know, and then so breaking Good up, point. breaking Good up point. electronically becomes an easy out. And we're not against progress. None no, of us are against no. progress, but it's it's to me it's frightening. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got these websites now, virtual friends, where a huge report was written in one of the the national newspapers about it, yep. where it's becoming very popular, where people are actually saying that these friends are actually better to me because through my thick and thin. Through my highs and lows, yes. my virtual friends are never judgmental and they're always with me. Well, that's because they don't really know you. No, right. And um, it's the easy way out. But to me, it's frightening where these youngsters are headed. And we've invented a language. I mean, I sometimes see my kids, uh, MSN or whatever latest, whatever the latest way of communicating is, and there's a whole language, a short form thing, a, a, a kind of... Um, um, what we what used to what would have been shorthand 50 mm -hmm. years ago that they use on computers that I can't even begin to understand. So we're creating whole new levels of language as well, which I find a little frightening. Actually, it is. I will tell you though, have any of your kids ever put up POS on the computer? Because if you see that, it means parent over shoulder. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm glad. I'm just oh, educating you. I feel friends. better now. <laughs> I'll remember that one You'll because I never know times. what any of them mean except LOL. I finally <laughs> yeah. took, me about, loud. took me about two years. And then sometimes they put a letter in there <laughs> to yes. emphasize the loud yes. out loud. So we do as parents, we do we do learn some of what they mean. POS, that's yeah. good. Remember that. <laughs> but down to basics, it's a sad thing that people won't face each other to even break up these days, and we're all in agreement there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well. well, the third subject matter, it's not unrelated to what we've been talking about. The Hollow Halls of Higher Learning. We'll be talking about it after this. Stay tuned. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Well, the Hollow Halls of Higher Learning. New book chronicles the university's demise. Unfortunately, we know according to stats that fewer kids are enrolling at universities. Now, according to this article, it's not only that, it's the, it's the atmosphere that university professors are starting to see on campus. For example, I thought it was quite strange to the two of you and to our audience that a professor dialogues here and says he was quite disheartened in a sense when he tried to give essays back and all he would find is a bunch of abandoned essays on the table. All the kids really want to see is a final mark. Yep. They don't seem to be interested, according to what this article says, in the actual issue of education, what it is they're learning. They're more obsessed with, I want to get that piece of paper and that's it. They go out into the world, according to this article, in this um, market quote fueled by credentialism and plagued by underemployment. The sad thing is, they don't have an interest, they just want the paper and they go out into the world with underemployment and they expect everything to be handed out to them. I've seen articles written that we've raised a generation of people, narcissists, mm -hmm. that are just very self-absorbed. The, all they consider is the end. They don't consider the means, they don't consider long term, what the real world is like. They just want this. But I, I think it was sad because I've always appreciated education, what it involved, what it did to expand the mind to learn. And here I'm seeing something here that I'm sure there are many professors that could, um, could attest to this, that the world has changed now. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've, I mean, I've been a professor at three different universities yep, and, a, right. and, and, and a college. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I got to say that 
10% of students really care wow. that they're there. And it's so sad. And you know... Um, okay, why'd they go? Is it for that piece of paper or because their well, parents sent them? I think, like, I'd, I'd say about 50% are just apathetic. They're just there because mm -hmm. it's something to do. Mm -hmm. um, good, Maybe a good 35% are there just to, I honestly believe, to make professors' lives miserable. So, um, but you know, it, 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 it honestly, if I had to take a, you know, choose again between going and working at McDonald's, not that I'm belittling, belittling McDonald's, but I'd rather go and work there because at least they're blunt about what they're doing. They're, 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 they're make a profit. I think our learning institutions um, are just there to, for competing for research dollars and they're competing for something else, but, but at the expense of teaching. And, and, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's funny because even when you do give uh, your students constructive feedback on their essays and what have you, they, they fight you over it. You know, and, As and it's pointed out here, because here it says one student was just totally irate and very yeah. abusive. Yeah, she got 60% and then she finally said, that does it, I'm dropping this class. I just said, anybody else? It was good <laughs> riddance. <laughs> And when, and when you talk uh -huh. about issues of cyberbullying, I mean, I, there's so many professors yeah, whose reputations have been destroyed wow. just because, you know, they gave a bad mark. Um, there are students who sue professors if they, don't, if they get a B. If they get a B and not an A, they'll turn around and sue you now. My so, goodness. so I mean, it's become very, very, very vicious in terms of the post-secondary. But you know, I, you, you can't sit there and blame universities. It's our whole education system that's broken. You know, we have under um, uh, um, under uh, resourced um, school a uh, school system. You know, we basically have um, kids coming up through the ranks who really, truly don't learn to read and write properly. And you know, and then when they get into first year university, all they do is multiple choice tests. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. right. And I, I'm, uh, this is where I prove my age again, but I, I think that we've really um, completely um, just mucked up the whole notion of education because we, yes. have, we have made education into some kind of training ground mm -hmm. that you are educated to do something as opposed to being educated to be educated. Yes. I want we've a, lost the love of learning. I want a rocket scientist who's read the the sonnets of Robert Browning. Mm -hmm. I want a medical doctor who knows Shakespeare. I want a mm. clergy person who understands um, uh, philosophy of nihilism. Yes. Yes. I want, um, uh, maybe I want a bus driver who loves Schubert. Mm -hmm. um, but we've lost this, the, mm. the, the beauty of general education, we've lost it at the high school level and at the post-secondary education level, I think we've just completely sold our souls to what are you going to do at university to train you to do something? Wow, it's frightening. Now, according to Alison Haynes, who wrote this article, here's what she also said, that we, we seem to have been, or from, from the, from, I'm talking from the high school days here, she's saying here, from the public school system. They're indoctrinated with this whole notion of self-esteem, she says, right. Right. at the expense of self-efficiency. She goes on to say that basically we focused on this, that everybody gets a good star, a gold star in fact for effort and every pupil is special and no child is ever left behind to repeat a grade no matter how lousy they do, basically they're put ahead because the self-esteem matters. But I understand the love of children and building up their self-esteem, but if you build up a child's self-esteem but you do not train that child in the realities of life and that child goes out there and finds, wait a minute, I thought I could get a job. I thought I was it. I thought I, you know, I, I had the gold star. Why is it that I can't transfer this gold star to the real world? Mm -hmm. You have virtually taught that child lies, deluded. That kid's delusional yeah, you, now. When, yeah, when you tell a kid that you know grades aren't everything or winning's not everything, you know, and, and let's say you're you come from a low-income background, your only way of getting into a, a university is through a scholarship, which is contingent on grades. Well, you know, you're speaking from you know, personal experience here, and that's something I want to get out because I, I'm going to make your story, your, your long story, really short here. You started out really bad, according to what people would say, and you ended up in trouble with the legal system mm -hmm. because you saw the power in the gun because mm -hmm. you were you were labeled as learning disabled yeah. from very young. Nobody took the time with you. Right. Today, PhD, you've mm -hmm. done so much with your life. You've helped people. You do a lot when it comes to contributing to society. So from that point of view, you learned the hard way. But there were those who would say, yes, you could do it because you found somebody who would help you. But there were those that kept telling you, too, you can't do it no matter what. No, mm -hmm. you, you need a balance. But, uh, you know, one of the things about, I guess, with me compared to what I see in other students is that I never had a spirit of entitlement. I always that believed. Important. I always believed yes. that I needed to work hard because the role mm. models I looked at were these people who worked hard to get ahead. Very but, good. but nowadays it just seems like 
uh, a student wants a uh, wants an A just for handing in their paper yeah. because we've taught them that. Hmm. And you know, and and in in elementary schools, they don't even grade kids. And you know, the, the, it's it's hurtful to their self esteem to give a kid an A or and a B. And if anything goes wrong, it's everybody else's fault. Yeah, yeah that's right. Wow, that's Peter. Right. Nobody fails. Everybody get everybody gets put ahead. And I have a son who's a great guy. He's a wonderful, wonderful young man. He's just finished first year university. He's probably not going to go back next year. He's sort of uh, typical, trying to figure that out. Typical of that age. And mm -hmm. part of it is that he's just not passionate enough about the learning. And I'm he glad understands you brought that, that up. in himself. We see a lot of kids in this generation that are like that. In fact, mm -hmm. it's very interesting because in the generation before, you, it was almost reversed that you saw kids that came from underprivileged backgrounds and boy, did they work hard to get ahead. Sorry. But now we're seeing very privileged kids that aren't doing anything with their lives because they in entitlement and they've been spoiled. Well, and, and, we, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, at my age, I'm in, I'm in my 50s, we, mm -hmm. I'm the first generation and represent the first generation in my family in which a university education was seen as a minimum. So all of my siblings, uh, we all went to university, none of my parents did, right? Um, and now, as that article points out, we've, in, in a relatively short space of time, let's say 50 years, we've gone to the point where 90% of mm -hmm. today's high school grade nine population, kids, or 90% of grade 9, that. that's right, mm -hmm. expect to go to university. Mm -hmm. So we need to figure out how to handle that degree of change. And I don't think we've done a very good job of it, mm -hmm. particularly because we've allowed um, the, the degree of specialization at the undergraduate level to just become so diffuse. I agree with you 100% on the, that one. That's a sore point that with a me. The general liberal arts yeah. education, yes. which is what I think we all need mm -hmm. at one level, before we get trained to do what it is we're going to do, um, hardly exists anymore. That's and that's right. really sad. Mm -hmm. And lear But learning takes different forms. My best friend, since I've known since I've been 11 years old, he dropped out of high school in grade 11. Um, we've been friends all our lives. He's a millionaire today. I'm not. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have a $100,000 student loan. You have but all that really, really happy. Remember that. <laughs> and he has a swimming pool. Yes, hold on to that. <laughs> but, 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 he, but you know, he, he learned in a different way. That's he right. was a visual learner. He learned with his hands. He learned construction. And now he, he owned up, he has his own uh, contracting That's company. That's fantastic. So, but Choice we, today yes. is big. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah. I, I jokingly say, given the work that I do, that I would like my children to get paid by the hour. Be a plumber. It's mm -hmm. good work. Everybody needs plumbers, and you go home from plumbing, and you don't have anything to worry about. Well, I think it's wise that, and I'm just putting this piece in, that, that young kids today, even if they don't feel ready to go to university, have some little skill sure. that they could fall back sure. on. If they can't Absolutely. make up their minds, make sure they get that little skill, yeah. Yeah. because they may, they may yeah. need to fall back on it. And, and it's become, I mean, it's become a, a, a kind of a culture of, of, of the credential, if you will. Yes. But I, what we need plumbers. Sure. We, we need construction workers. I, I know there'll mm -hmm. be better tithers in your church. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a note we need to end on here. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. We're out of time. Thank you both so Thank much you. for joining me today. Thank you. We're going to go for a break now. When we come back, I'll be interviewing the author of Confessions of a Good Christian Girl. Stay tuned.